this is probably my favorite part of the weekend. You don't know because I'm always saying that for every event that I'm on stage, but it's okay. Um, we have some great people that are going to be joining me uh, right away. So I'm going to invite them to the stage right now so they can introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Julie Zaki. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Je sais que vous allez bien. Est-ce qu'il y en a qui parlent français? Woo! Je vous reconnais du train, en fait, mais c'est bon. Um, so I, um, I was with Jack.org for, I don't know, four to six years, depending on how much you want to count the pandemic. Um, so, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in community psychology at UCAM. And yeah. Great. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Skelding. Um, I started with Jack.org. Oh my gosh, you, you did your number of years you've been and I was like, I, I can't calculate it. I'm out of my head right now. Um, I think it's been around five or six years, but uh, I've been involved. I've been one of you. I've been at a Jack Summit. Um, I've been a Jack Talk speaker. I helped you run a regional summit in Kingston. Um, I went to Queens University for four years in kinesiology. Anyone from Queens here? Woo! Woo! <laughs> yeah, Ali. Um, and now I am working for RBC. I'm in human resources on a leadership development team. And I'm so, so excited to be here with, honestly, kings and queens, all of you too. Very inspiring. So thanks for having me. Welcome. We're happy to have you too. So, Bay, what's hey. up? Is it working out? Oh, hi, everyone. Unusakud. Uh, uh, my name is Sophie Waje, Sophie Waje Uyunga. I'm from Makali Nunavut. Um, I'm the Youth Network Advisor this year. Well, one of the two. Um, I've been with Jack for about four or five years. Uh, as a Jack, as Jack, talk, Jack Talk speaker, I led a chapter. I was a network rep for two years. Um, kind of done a bit of all of it. Um, I'm a nurse. I'm also a master's student public health and I work for the government of Nunavut outside of all my other work. Okay, nice to meet, to meet you all. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. And finally, Ali, what's up? Uh, not much. So my name is Ali. <laughs> nice to meet everyone. Uh, really nice to be back in person for these things. Um, I've been with Jack.org since 2016. Uh, I was a speaker, Jack Talk speaker, so definitely not as versed in, and didn't wear as many hats as my fellow speakers here and panelists, but uh, had a wonderful time interacting and meeting different people and connecting with them through our stories. So uh, really nice to be back here to be able to share some of mine through, uh, through the past couple of years with this panel. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student at University of Toronto, so I've uh, been in Toronto for quite a bit of time. Also feels a bit weird because of the pandemic of like how long I've actually spent and gone around the city, but really grateful to, to meet everyone here and uh, be here with all my panelists. Thank you. So we have la creme de la creme, how we say in French, la creme de la creme, right here on stage with us. So it's going to be really interesting and really fantastic to speak with them. So I'm going to start and get into the, you know, the conversation because, you know, it's really interesting. And um, so we're going to talk with Sarah. Uh, you were super involved at Jack, like you said. You named so many things that you did, network rep, program, everything. And outside of the network, you you stayed and you you were talking, like you, sorry, you worked with other people that were actually part of the network. So how was it? Did you feel like Jack gave you the tools to work with other people outside of the network? For sure. Um, yeah, Jack in general has connected me in a lot of different ways to opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. But yeah, as you mentioned, you know, I was at work and was kind of at a point where I felt like I was falling out of some of the advocacy work I was doing and wanted to get back into it. So um, I took on a bit of a stretch assignment, um, got connected uh, through a, a colleague to work on this um, program that was helping youth autism services networks in, uh, in the York region in Ontario. So um, it was like a pro bono consulting opportunity. I'm brand new to this kind of work. And I joined my first call on the project, kind of weekly update. And, and lo and behold, there's a guy there that I used to work on uh, my Jack chapter with at Queens that's there. And he's like the 
consultant that is <laughs> running the project. So I got to work with him quite closely. We still are working together on this project. And um, it's been really cool. It's been really great to like work with someone that I already was doing some advocacy work with. We know how we work together. We've been very honest with each other and like giving some feedback on uh, building a solution together. And uh, he's also taught me so, so much about consulting and strategy, which are brand new areas for me, even stuff that like I would have never had interfaced in my role, like data governance frameworks, like very out of the box stuff. So yeah, it's been very cool, very great to work with um, people in the network in my role today. And, you know, even I like, I met Ali five years ago at our Jack Summit that we were at together, um, just through both going to Queens and now here I am sharing a stage with him. So, you know, it, it all comes back around. So if there's one thing I can say, just like keep these connections, get each other on Instagram, I don't know, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever you're doing now. Um, <laughs> and, and stay connected because, yeah, you never know when you might have a chance to work with someone again. So, oh, sorry. So it really created this community of person that you can actually reach out whatever sphere they're working in or whatever place they're working in because you know that, like you said, whatever they're using, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and whatever, um, you'll be able to reach out to them and get the knowledge that you need, right? Yeah, and they even might have some like cool opportunities if you're like me and feel like you're falling out of your advocacy work a bit and want to get back into it. Like there's so much advocacy work to go around. So um, just keeping connected with them, seeing what they're into, seeing what they're up to, um, to just, yeah, get back into some of the work if you're interested. That's great. So talking about community, that brings me to Julie because uh, Julie is currently a student, right? I'm not mistaken. And she, well, the last time we spoke, you talked about how you really liked the, the community-focused work that you were doing because it's more person-focused. You are able to actually reach out to people on a heart-to-heart, -heart, if I could say that, level. So could you share a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so basically, at first, I was pursuing my PhD in clinical psychology and um, actually through my work with Jack.org and just through going through my classes, you know, I started to think differently. I started to tell myself, like, who's actually going to end up in therapy with me? Um, and then I started thinking, well, it's probably someone who's well-educated or someone who's financially um, stable. And it's not to say that those people don't have their place in therapy. Of course, they do. But it just got me thinking about how this system is built, right? So if you want to access um, free mental health resources, then that means... Um, that you would have to wait a long time. So there is actually an inequality in how the system is made. And when we said when we when you talked about like a person focus, well, if you do access the the free mental health care, well, you don't really have a lot of say on what the treatment or the care is going to look like. If you want to incorporate your faith in that, your spiritual um, aspects of it, a cultural aspects in your treatment and your recovery, and so I just felt a bit uncomfortable with all that, and also knowing that a lot of the things are, you know, if someone is in front of me and is living with a mental illness and it's a result of, I don't know, racism, academic pressure, um, all of things that are environmental and I wasn't actually intervening on those levels. It just didn't sit right with me. So that's kind of why I did the switch. And um, I wanted to basically intervene on those levels. And community psychology is like very vast and like maybe you don't know what it is specifically, but this is actually what we're doing here, is that we understand how an individual is in their group, in their community, in their neighborhood, in their society, and how those impact their well-being. And what I'm doing is that I'm trying to sort of be an agent of social change and bring social justice so we work on the strength of that person or community so they can actually um, have a say and take action in their environment. And so it's kind of different instead of being instead of it being one one on one and um, obviously we're all agent of social change here you you all are and what i've learned something that's really interesting is that we need to think globally but act locally so think about what you want to see in canada what do you want to see in your society have that picture but act locally because we have a lot of strength in our communities um, you know what's best, you know, in your school, what's going to work, you know, what are the barriers. Um, so I encourage you to actually start by working locally and then 
this will actually build a bigger movement. That's what we've seen throughout the ten, like the past 10 years, right? Is that we started with a vision and now we've got it and we're actually going to move forward with other goals in mind. I like what you said. That's, that's really inspiring. Wow. Because when you think about it, most of the time we're, we're always talking about change on a bigger level, bigger level, bigger level. But like you said, when we start local and it's like you see when you put a small drop in the ocean and you're like, that's a small drop. Nothing's going to happen from that. But like it creates ripples. And I feel like in the mental health world, that's what we're doing when you're coming. Just you being here is going to change something. You're going to go and talk about it to someone. So it's really interesting to see how community based approach is really um, the, in my opinion, the way to go. Like, there's other ways to go, but it's a it's a great way to go. And that brings me to somebody that works with community a lot, Sope. Um, she the she's amazing. She do everything. She has like three thousand hats. So she's on the board of director here. She's a healthcare professional. She's a student. I mean, she's everything. Like, she could run for prime minister. Like, she's she does everything. Okay, and. Um, this, this brings me to, to ask you a small question, like, how do you do all of that while also maintaining your mental health? Because that's a lot of responsibility for one person, and you're acing all of them, so tell us how you do. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for being so nice. Hey, um, that's a good question. I think, as this probably repeated a lot but balance is crucial right like I do all these things but um I understand the importance of my balance and being self-aware is critical I know things that you know keep me healthy and things that trigger me and how am I able to bounce back when I'm not healthy um to be healthy and be able to participate in things that I'm passionate about mental health is um, really important to me. It's in every part of my work, in my healthcare professional life, it, with Jack Network, with my surveillance work, with my MPH, like all across it, I'm constantly including mental health. And um, I think being able to balance, being self-aware in your own work, and just understanding that sometimes it's okay to not do anything. And because there are days where I'm like, I get an email and I'm like, Ah, snooze <laughs> sorry <laughs> like I am like hi thanks for reaching out but unfortunately I've got like 70 other things I'm doing um it's also hard sometimes because you see something you're like oh my gosh that's amazing like I want to be part of that but um once again like understanding that you can't do everything you can take the time to just be you and you don't always I think like we're in this hustle mentality all the time like I gotta be doing this I gotta be doing that some days you wake up be like what are you doing today zilch like I'm chilling like that's what I'm doing today that's what I'm doing this month like I'm doing nothing like I'm not here to really do I'm just gonna take care of myself take care of my mental health and um elevate my own mindset like that's I think that's that's important that's kind of how I do it and I hope that other people are able to kind of take that into consideration like you don't always have to be doing something you know like you don't always have to be working taking care of yourself is enough I told you she could become prime minister. Look at the wise word that came from her mouth. Like, come on now. And I like it because we live in a society that's so much focused on, I, I, I call it fast food society. It's everything's fast. We need to, I want it now. I need to do this right now. And like, if I don't do it right now, it, it's not going to happen. And I feel like, like you said, I was looking at uh, an IG post and it might sound wrong, but I, I really connected with it. It was like, it's okay to be mediocre sometimes. Yeah. It's okay to do nothing. It's okay to just be like, hey, today I'm going to lay, watch Netflix, and eat food all day. And if that's my way to relax, that's my way to relax. So like she said, sometimes take a break. Super, like, normal to do it. Don't feel the pressure to be like, oh, my God, I have to do this right now. Or like, no, nothing's going to happen. You take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And talking about healthcare, taking care of themselves, Ali, um, and I, I practice the word that I'm about to say a lot because I struggle with it. You have a PhD in neuro-oncology. That's the word, right? Yeah. Hey, I got it, guys. <laughs> I got it. Neuro-oncology, okay? And um, if you could just give us like a small 10 second of what it is and then like talk about how you're trying to advocate for change in 
this sector and in the like postgraduate sector also? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think 10 seconds is enough, but I'm going to I'm going to try. Uh, so neuro oncology, uh, the field is just surrounding brain cancers. So pediatric and adult. Um, and there's a number of different uh, types of brain cancers that are out there. I'm not going to go into them, but they definitely de end up impacting uh, your cognitive function. And depending on which ones you're looking at, it can have a larger impact uh, over your lifetime. So I personally work with pediatric uh, brain cancer and if you just imagine chemo treatment or radiation and the impact it has on adults, um, impacting infants with these types of treatments is uh, deadly. And, and apart from survival, there's a lot of neurocognitive impairment that occurs that lasts a very long time. And you know, we're looking at it through a perspective of improving the types of treatments that we're providing children, but also when it comes to support that we can provide them over a lifetime is very important as well. Um, but in terms of support, uh, to address this latter part of your question, uh, around postgraduate and graduate students, you know, I feel like once you move away from undergrad where uh, you have a number of different events and opportunities that are available because you're so connected with the school, um, once you move into a graduate program that is more research-based, and perhaps, Julie, you can perhaps uh, connect with this as well, um, you're a bit more tertiary to everything that's happening within that community. And so the support systems that are present there, um, they don't really connect with us very well. Um, unfortunately, apart from the workplace or the local specific environment that you're in, um, there's ne not much human connection that's there at that mental health support level. Um, and it becomes very difficult because then you uh, expect to get support or wish to get support from people that are around you. And unless you're equipped with the types of um, conversations that we have here, uh, it becomes very difficult to get that support. And so um, at least when it comes to uh, my personal experience and, and the field that I'm in, uh, we see that like mental health is not really spoken about uh, as much uh, in my program. We've just started to have this conversation and it's limited to a five minute conversation that we have you know, once in a while at a seminar. And, you know, as you've seen from this weekend alone, um, five minutes, let alone this weekend, is not enough to really talk about some of the topics that we want to cover. And so a lot of individuals are left with uh, no resources or uh, even the information to, to you know, think for themselves in these types of situations. Uh, and it's wonderful that we have organizations like uh, Jack.org that does raise awareness. And being a speaker, it's, it's been wonderful to uh, go to different schools to talk about this. Um, it would be nice to see more awareness at the graduate level, um, sometimes People have missed the train depending on when they uh, started this conversation. And so I'm really seeing individuals um, start that conversation earlier on. Uh, everyone is very well equipped and um, intelligent. So once they become a bit more familiar with the topic, um, I, I see them uh, taking the ground and running with it. Sorry, just like run, like hitting, hitting the ground and running with it and really making the most out of what they can when it comes to this movement. So um, again, yeah, so just starting the conversation I think is really important. Totally agreed. Totally agreed. And especially we're talking about conversation. And right now you guys did workshops, you did collab session, and you're having conversation with one and each other. And you don't see that you're making yourself more, how can I say, you're getting more knowledge out of these conversations. Because I don't know everything about mental health. None of them know anything about it, like everything about mental health, sorry. <laughs> and uh, by, by, by sitting and talking to people, that's the way that we learn. And by listening to each other, because we all have different perspective and different views of it. So I feel like I'm learning so much from you right now. I could sit down and listen to you all day. Um, and especially talking about awareness, awareness sorry. Um, I'm going back to Julie. Um, Julie, tu as été une des premières uh, à chapeauter, si je pourrais dire, euh, le mouvement francophone, de l'amener de l'avant. Euh, une des raisons pour laquelle je suis sur scène en ce moment, c'est un peu à cause de toi, dans un sens, parce que en voyant d'autres francophones, euh, je me suis dit que moi, si j'avais ma place, chez Jack.org, donc euh, comment est-ce que ça a été au début de, de tout faire? La traduction, euh, les programmes, euh, les activités, le sommet, comment c'était d'avoir cette charge, d'avoir cette responsabilité sur les épaules? Um... C'était vraiment excitant, mais je pense qu'il y avait une source de naïveté avec tout ça, parce que la motivation vient beaucoup avec optimisme, je pourrais plus dire que naïveté. Um, puis, tu sais, c'est comme, au début, je suis allée sur le site de Jack, puis là, je cherchais le bouton français, 
Puis là, je, je le trouvais pas. Puis je suis comme, ah, oh, OK, non, ça ne marchera pas. Puis après, je suis comme, ah, oh, mais on peut juste commencer une section en français. Um, fait qu'à chaque personne à qui je parlais de Jack.org, c'était comme, oui, j'ai pas eu un seul nom pour commencer la première section parce qu'on savait que c'était un mouvement plus grand que nous puis qu'on amenait ça aussi vers le Canada francophone. Puis on savait que c'était pas juste comme un autre euh, club étudiant. On avait, on avait tout le support, le soutien financier, mais aussi par rapport à nos compétences, nos connaissances et tout ça. Fait que c'est sûr qu'au début, c'était un peu plus... Euh, une plus grande charge parce qu'il fallait, comme tu as dit, traduire. Il n'y avait pas personne non plus au siège social qui parlait français. Um, puis après de la traduction, mais on a été plus mené vers réviser. Donc, tu sais, avec euh, le sommet, avec euh, les premières euh, présentations de Jack aussi, c'était beaucoup révision. Puis je sais que là, on s'en va vers autre chose. Puis moi, ce que j'aimerais qu'on aille, c'est qu'on aille vers une équité. Fait une équité en ce qui concerne la santé mentale dans le Canada francophone et le Canada anglophone. On n'est pas encore dans, à l'équité, malheureusement, mais ça s'en vient. Mais pour avoir cette équité-là, il faut qu'on forme une grande table avec tous les francophones, pas juste du Québec. C'est sûr que moi, je peux parler du Québec, mais former une table avec tous les francophones du Canada, tu sais, Nouveau-Brunswick, Ontario, un peu partout, puis voir c'est quoi les besoins de ces personnes-là. C'est quoi qu'eux ont besoin? C'est quoi dans les communautés anglophones que ça fonctionnerait pour les francophones aussi? Qu'est-ce qui ne fonctionne pas? C'est quoi les barrières aussi? Ça, c'est une autre réflexion. Tu sais, moi, je, moi et toi, on est bilingues. Fait qu'on a aussi un privilège de faire le pont. Puis moi, je dois t'avouer que je n'ai pas toujours réussi à bien faire le pont, mais je pense que c'est sûr que les, les, les nouveaux leaders, puis toi, vous le faites beaucoup mieux. Puis ça s'en vient, tu sais, mais c'est comme penser à comment je peux utiliser mon privilège de pouvoir parler anglais pour le ramener aussi dans ma communauté d'avoir la, la, cette réflexion aussi dans toutes les organisations, vraiment. C'est comme, qu'est-ce que je suis en train de faire que peut-être ça nuit, parce que là, on a comme, on a du rattrapage en français à faire, c'est clair, mais on est capable de le faire, mais c'est juste qu'il faut avoir tout le monde autour de la table pour euh, les personnes vraiment concernées qui parlent français, qui disent ça, ça marche, ça, ça marche pas, avoir même des programmes qui n'existeraient pas dans les communautés anglophones, et c'est correct. Mais là, on passe vraiment de adapter de l'anglais à créer des programmes et des, et des nouvelles... Euh, des nouvelles compétences et tout ça en français. You mind summarizing this in 10 seconds in English for our audience? Wow, you just put me on the spot. <laughs> I, I heard a lot of people going like, yes, what she's saying is so important, but I don't understand it. But I, it's really nice. I'll get to the most important part, which is about, um, you know, we've started about like translating and then sort of adapting the programs from English, French, and we're beyond that. We need to reach out for equity equity between the two languages, equity between people. And to do that, we have to gather every Francophone community, well, every representative, at least from the Francophone communities all across Canada, around the table, and ask them, what do they need? What are the programs that work for them? What are the barriers within Jack.org that could actually hinder them from getting the same um, support when it comes to mental health? And I, also, I will also talk about how we, as bilingual people, we should actually connect between the head office and our communities and I haven't done it always the right way but we will get there and I'm sure we'll, in the before the next 10 years we'll get to equity but we need to get the people who are concerned involved perfect perfect and you talked about action and I feel like um We often talk about action as individuals, but organizations also need to take action. And that brings me back to Ali, where you know that as a PhD student, um, when students um, get placement or co-op offers, or they get into corporation, or they get into a, a, the place where they need a job, and they don't always have the support from those corporation to actually succeed with their, with their mental health. So what are the actions that the organization can take to make sure that they're not putting too much stress on those students, on all of us, that if you're pursuing um, a PhD or a master at some point, you'll get the stress from it. I don't want you to get, but eventually you'll get the stress from it. But like, how can organization help everybody to be better and to have a better mental health when they're doing those jobs? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm gonna speak from my experience once again, and, and I'm gonna pull uh, a few points from what we just spoke about. You, you spoke about hustle uh, and being on all the time and, and like the society that we're currently living in uh, that is sort of a metric for success. Um, the harder you're working, 
uh, the more successful you are in, in whatever career that you're in. And, and unfortunately, what happens is um, it's that society is adapting that perspective from the culture that we create in workplaces. Um, and it, it's the same in science as well. Um, there's certain expectations that you have in order to succeed within the field um, that I personally wasn't aware of until I came into that environment itself. Um, and unfortunately, because that's the culture around it, and that's been the culture for um, 50, 60 years, uh, it's difficult to change at that uh, structural level um, right now uh, because these conversations that we're having, it's still with the youth. And it's not with some of those individuals that, that could make that change or could push for that change. Um, and so personally, what I've seen is we have departments where uh, we can bring forward conversations and agendas where uh, we want to start seeing differences um, at small group levels. So we have a number of different groups that are part of each department um, and we have a supervisor that looks over them. Uh, and sometimes these conversations, when they come up, the importance of these conversations aren't really relayed or accepted very well. Um, it's more of this is an administrative item that we need to cross off this uh, meeting. Um, and, and unfortunately, unless like we're able to connect with um, individuals at that department level outside of students, um, we won't be able to see change in the near future in some of these uh, workplaces. Uh, and so it is great that the youth are getting involved and we are connecting with the future generations. Um, but I think we need to take a step back. And when we look at these institutions and environments that these students are in and are being impacted when it comes to the mental health, that we need to go to the root of the problem and address some of the cultural changes that are being led by individuals that still are unfamiliar with the importance of mental health in the workplace. I totally agree, like, especially like as alumni, I feel like this is going to be something that's going to be great because we'll be able to, we're doing a lot of great work with the youth, but I always say to a lot of people that I'm talking, we need to address the adults too because they're part of the solution. If I talk to the youth and they go back at home and there's a wall that they're hitting, we're getting nowhere. So I feel like the work that we'll be doing and that you, everybody can, can, everybody can do, sorry, um, is to try to push it further like after the youth, what do we do? How can we connect with adults to make them understand that, hey, we're doing our part of the job. You need to do your part too, because this is not a one-way thing. And um, just going back, like taking a step back and I, uh, I was one of the, the, the first black guy uh, at Jack, uh, black dude, black men, uh, because before me, there was Sope. And um, Sope was one of the first person that I've seen uh, when I was looking at Jack probably three years ago. She was like one of the first black women um, and she carried the load of so many, like she carried the load of black individual and also indigenous individual. And like, like I said, like how is it to be this pioneer that just came into an organization and like as a black woman, cause you're a minority into a minority when we think about it. Like, you're a black woman working into indigenous community that are also a minority in Canada. So like, how do you deal with that? Like, how was it? Was it hard? Was it tough? Is it still tough today? Um, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I wanna clarify, I'm not Canadian indigenous. No, I know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, um, I think that as a black woman, when I first came into Jack, Jack was Jack.org, the network. Um, I was in a critical time in my life, and the network was very, it was important. It's very important to me. I was struggling with PTSD and that diagnosis. I was, uh, I had just lost a loved one at that time. So it was, I was in this space of just, I need something. And then I found jack.org and I was, I meant like totally inserted myself into this uh, network and I was learning so much about mental health and my community as a black woman and the work that I needed to do and getting all that knowledge. And as was previously mentioned, you take the information that you learn here and you take it out into your communities and you share that. I took that and I take it home and I share it with my family who I come from a culture where mental health is not spoken about very much. You know, they're once again, like from hustle, hustle society, like a lot of black individuals are just taught to, you have to work 
twice as hard as another person to be able to be seen. And so there's that, like, you don't have time to be weak. You have to just be strong. I, I'm a delicate person, okay? I didn't come to this world to suffer. So um, I came here to be a flower. <laughs> so I was I'm very much like, I'm struggling and I'm telling my family, I'm sharing with my parents. And now, even from where I started couple years ago till now my mom's like going to work and she was like I talked to someone about mental health and I'm like good thank you <laughs> she's like are you proud of me like I know something about because anytime someone's talking about my mom's like I know something about mental health <laughs> she's like my daughter talks about it all the time yeah and just being able to take that information into my community we're uh working in Nunavut residing on indigenous land I'm so very grateful to live on Inuit Nunangat and to be able to learn from culture and to be able to take all of the cultural learnings and um, encourage self-determination in my own community. And that's crucial. I'm, you know, even though I'm like the first representative from Nunavut, I understand that as a non-Inuit, it's not my space to continue being Re like representative of Nunavut. I'm very proud of Gwen, who's the network rep this year. Um, and I feel like she may feel like I created that space, but um, allow working with resources and creating the table or sitting at the table are different things to me. And I might have um, worked with Jack to create resources for Gwen to be able to sit at the table. And I'm really glad that she is. And I hope that that paves way for more Inuit to be able to sit at the table and create their own table because, you know, we're also in the space where indigenous um, content is not as well known, I guess. We're still very much westernized. And, you know, sometimes we talk about programming and what that looks like across Canada. And I'm always saying, people are like, oh, we need more from Jack. We need more from Jack. And I'm like, um, actually, we're still on destigmatization. And I'm still focusing on that. You know, some communities are far ahead because they don't have to work on decolonization and they don't have to focus on that trauma and intergenerational trauma that the rest of us have to carry on. You know, they're they're not carrying that burden. So they're like, yeah, I'm past stigma. I'm just like working on advocacy with the leaders, leaders of their community. But the rest of us are still trying to like get past that intergenerational trauma. We're still trying to heal. We're still trying to, you know, do all that work for our community. And so I think in that space, it's been hard. It will, I, I want to say, I hope it's not going to continue to be hard but I know that the work that we're doing we're doing it for our community we want to see our communities excel I want to see and I want to see Nunavut you know like elevate I want to see us you know being people hearing our stories I want um, indigenous knowledge systems to be just integrated into everything and not westernized you know systems taking over and telling us how to deal with our mental health and people are not thinking about indigenous knowledge systems as well so it's going to be hard there's a lot of work to be done and I hope that everyone is taking you know time to um, figure out what they're going to do to decolonize in their own workspaces in their own lives and on a daily basis does that answer your question and she asked me does that answer your question does come that, on now Come on. So we're, 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 we're short on time, but we'll be able to, to take one audience question and one virtual question. Um, if you could address it to Sarah, that would be great because, you know, <laughs> I was supposed to ask her a question, but it's okay. Um, I don't know who's the mic passer in the audience because I wish I could do it, but like I have a, a rope. Do you call that a rope? A cord. Hey, sorry, excuse my French. Oui, oui, français. Excuse, excuse me, okay? <laughs> there are Phil. J'allais dire en français, je savais, tu vois? C'est juste que le cord. It's hard sometimes. Who has a question? Oh. Name yourself. Uh, my name is Rachel. Um, my question is when did you personally realize that you were making a significant difference with Jack.org and mental health? Like, when were you like, oh my gosh? This is actually like working, quote unquote. Sarah, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh wow, big question that I got there. Um, no, no, don't apologize. Thank you for it. Um, that's a good question, and I think I still 
haven't fully realized it yet, which sounds weird to say. Like I've had moments where I did like a Jack Talks tour through Whistler and Vancouver and Squamish and like Vancouver Island where I did like nine talks in like the span of three days or something. And it was a lot, but I came out of it and like I had someone after one of my talks come up to me and like share that they were having thoughts of suicide. And, you know, I thought, wow, like if I am creating this space and sharing this and someone feels like they can come up to me and talk about this after like that, that was a huge thing for me. Um, and I think even now, like now that I'm working in a corporate environment um, and I'm doing some of this work with like, it's not necessarily mental health related, but like this youth autism services network um, and helping to like create a solution for them to unite the different agencies that are working kind of in silos right now, unite the, da their data processes so that when a client comes in or a family comes in uh, with a child that lives with autism and they are uh, looking for a different service, like they can refer other people to different services. So it's, it's kind of like helping to interconnect the network a bit and the work isn't done yet. But I think when it is done, it'll just help a bunch of families. So I think that's some of the work. But on a smaller scale, like I'm just really resonating with what you said about the like think globally, act locally thing. Like I think even in, on my own team that I'm working on right now, um, my biggest thing that I think about all the time is like how can I create psychologically safe workplaces um, where people feel comfortable sharing even doesn't need to be mental health, but also just they feel comfortable opening up about their ideas or things they want to share. Like even if you're brand new to, if you're like me and like 26, joining a workplace full of adults, you know, making sure that I'm feeling comfortable or other youth that are entering the workforce are feeling comfortable to speak up and share on anything really. So that's, I'm, I'm working on that little by little. And I think it's like, it's, it's starting locally. I hope it kind of spreads a bit more, but that's, I don't know when I will feel it. I've had moments, but I think that's, that's all you can ask for too. It's just little pockets of like, okay, I think I made a what difference for like that one person that came up to me after the Jack talk, or I feel like I made that person feel comfortable to share something in a meeting that maybe they wouldn't have. So yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Sarah. Do we have a virtual question? Oh, 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 okay. That's a great question. Okay, quickly. So 30 seconds each. I'll count in my head. Um, Yes. Uh, what do you expect for the next 10 years in the network or outside of the network? We're going to start from far left to near me. So Ali, start. Sure. Um, I think we're getting so integrated with technology right now. And I think we've made a big push uh, uh, with Be There and the different campaigns that we've had within the network and outside of the network. Uh, but it would be good to see us to continue that trend. Um, especially to connect with uh, the youth of this generation that are on these devices. Um, and so I definitely would like to see more integration with technology when it comes to some of these resources. That's great. Sope? Okay. I think in the next 10, I would like to see um, more programming directed towards POC communities and also Indigenous knowledge systems carrying their own mental health services, um, leading and creating their own work. Um, I would like to see us all nationally, I guess, rise above stigma in the next 10 years. Uh, not some people rising above stigma and then some people still focusing on stigma. All of us in the next 10 years working towards advocacy. Agreed. Me too. Sarah. Um, I want to see Dr. go global. I want everyone to know what this is. I want everyone to know the five golden rules. I just want it to like be everyone knows about Jack to Dark. And I also think that you guys are all so skilled and know so much and your skills are only going to grow more and more as you age that you guys can come up with the solution that like helps with our network. You are so smart and you're all here because you're or listening to this because you're all very talented and very bright. So 
yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> Tell us what you're going to create. Judy? This is a tough question, I but mean, I want to see, I want to see it be a norm that when we talk about mental health, we integrate every single field as well. So we talk about, you know, affordable housing, reducing social and economic inequalities, working on systemic racism and all of that. And that's just like a norm. We all work together um, and that will foster a more positive mental health. And for the network, I would love to see a national francophone Jack Summit. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, but maybe we could do something like that. So thank you for sharing so much. And as you can see, uh, those alumni, we're going to start the alumni network uh, very, very soon. I think it's, is it live? Taylor, is it live? It's going to be live starting today. So um, all the work that they done while they were in the network, they'll be able to continue to do outside of the network. I'm probably growing. I'm also aging out soon, so I'm probably going to be on their side um, in a year. So, uh, but keep doing the good work that you're doing. And same to you. I wish you all the best for your next activities. And I hope that we'll be able to connect with the alumni network that we're all going to be part of. And thank you for listening to me. Listening to me. Thank you for listening to them. And you've been a wonderful crowd. I'm going to bring my MC back on the stage.